thank you for joining us at the 2022 edition of Expo Chicago, the international exposition of contemporary and modern art. We are delighted to welcome you to Exchange by Northern Trust, an interna interactive conversation around the art of collecting. Today's program features the conversation Collecting with Family in partnership with TPC Art Finance, Heritage Auctions, and Risk Strategies. The panel is being video recorded for archival and possible future promotional purposes. Any audience questions or interactions will not be included in future promotional materials. Today's moderator will be Juan Alonzo, Senior Vice President and Chief Banking Officer at Northern Trust. Now, please join me in welcoming Juan and the rest of our panelists to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Hello, everybody. And I know that pretty soon this will be standing room only. Um, about two months ago, when we were approached about doing this, uh, I said yes. I was very excited about it. And after meeting the panelists here, I, I really feel very privileged to be with this group. Uh, let me introduce them. First, Roberta Kramer, sitting to my direct right. She's the uh, Vice President and Managing Director at Heritage Auctions. And I asked them all to write a little bit about themselves, and she was the most modest, because she has a lot of experience on the advisory side and all facets of art, and I think that her perspective will be very interesting. To her right is uh, Alyssa Rizzo. I have the privilege of working with uh, Alyssa. She is our Chief Fiduciary Officer at Northern Trust for the East Region. Uh, and then she also says that, if I get it correctly, you are a reformed, recovering. a recovering, recovering trust and estate uh, attorney. Um, Alyssa has a lot of experience with uh, estate planning, multi-generational, and then she's got a lot of those situations have involved art. And uh, what she will be very helpful with is if we're not doing the right things according to what they say, it ends up being something that she can tell a story about, which is called the spilled milk. Then we have uh, Christopher Wise. He's with Risk Strategies. Uh, he's in New York. They have an office in uh, Chicago. And he's on the insurance side. And he's got over 20 years of, of uh, experience. And I think that just from our conversations that we've had, he has seen it come from different angles. In fact, we just had a short conversation about questions that people should be asking and risks that people take that maybe they have not considered the risks that they're taking. And then on the far end with, uh, is uh, Naomi Begel. Naomi is with uh, TPC Art Finance. And I've known Naomi for a number of years from uh, uh, New York. And she is on the financing side, which is at times, people may not even know that if they have an art collection that they can use it to monetize it, to grab uh, liquidity from it, and meet some uh, liquidity needs. So, so she's here to talk about that. I want to go back to the, uh, to the title, is Collecting with Family. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, what does collecting mean? This is not just for people that have established, significant, substantial art collections for many years, but we also wanted this to include newer collectors, people that were starting it, people that were considering it, and, and almost like a best practices as to what to do when you're starting a collection. So I think that the, what the panelists will have to say has merit, not just from the established collector, but from what a newer collector should be thinking about. Then we, then we said, collecting, what's collecting, what's family, and how do we, should we define it? And it could be a small family, a large family, multi-generational. It could be like a family tree that looks like a forest. But what it, it explicitly means is that it involves others. And that when you're starting a collection, you have a collection that involves others and other considerations other than that's my taste, that's what I want to do, this is how I'm going to insure it, this is what I'm going to do with it. So it involves others. One of the interesting things when we first started talking about it was having an art panel, having a panel at an art fair, 
And uh, both Naomi and Roberta had some interesting comments about that because I said, why is it that panels are done at art fairs and what's the value of that? And I'll invite Naomi first. Naomi, could you just talk about that? Because I found that very interesting from our initial conversation. And I thought that sharing it would be uh, important to this group. Absolutely, happy to. I think that the art fairs are a place where everybody is at a level playing field. You come in, you can look at the art, but for the first time or for generations if you've been looking at art, you can speak to the dealers, you can speak to the people, you can see what other people are looking at. It breaks down barriers. It's a, the art world is a very opaque marketplace and a very scary place for people who might not feel that they understand how to enter that sphere. And in places like Chicago especially, where there's a warmth and a generation of, of people within Chicago, and Roberta can speak to this more clearly than me, that have been collecting for generations and generations, it gives everybody the opportunity to come in and talk to people and understand what's in their community, not only here in Chicago, but galleries around the world who come here. Actually, an interesting anecdote is that the Chicago Art Fair, in its first iteration, was the first international art fair in the United States. So it always has had this history of acceptance and bringing people in from all over the world, not only as the galleries, but as the visitors to it. Um, I'll send it over to you, Frida, at whatever comment. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's quite right. I mean, you go back to the kind of founding families of Chicago, the, you know, the Potter Palmers and the Fields and the Armors, et cetera, and a big thrust in the 19th century here as the museum was started, et cetera, was in fact to look out to the whole world and see what was happening, not just be so insular. I think one of the other, you know, Naomi's quite right. There's, it's easier to speak with, it's not just the introduction. The gallerists are here, they are here to talk to people and meet people and doesn't always work that way when you walk into their gallery, uh, especially maybe in New York. The other thing from our topic here, if, if we're talking about more than one generation of a family, bringing younger family members to a fair allows you to see their reactions and what interests them in a way that would be extremely onerous in, in galleries. I mean, how many galleries would you have to drag your kids and grandchildren to? Because if you walk into a gallery and it, there's nothing for you or you're not interested, that's it, you're bored, now you're done. And people aren't talking to you. And the one, the one thing I want to add is that in everything that we do is about education. And having a panel within an art fair where everybody's coming in we can hopefully educate people in areas of expertise that they didn't understand or know and want to learn about. I have to say, we've got a few minutes here, but each, I think we could have a full panel discussion on each of their areas of expertise. So I wanted to do it this way, through Roberta, especially talk about the, the opening part, the art advisory part. Once you acquire the art, you have to insure it. Once you insure it, you have to know what you're gonna do with it, you know, after you're gone or as you pass it down. But then as you own it, you wanna know what options you have to get the finances. So I'll start with uh, Roberta. How do you approach collecting among different generations and how is it different from dealing with an individual? Well, it's very different because even with just spouses, partners, you wouldn't believe the, uh, or maybe you would, the uh, disagreements. Um, I don't like that. I'm not living with that in my house, etc. It's even more complicated with other generations. Very much, I liken it to philanthropy is very complicated because what I may feel is of interest to me is not of interest to my son in his mid-twenties and will be probably even of less interest to his children 10 years from now. So you, you need to 
first if you haven't already started. It's different if, let's say, grandma already has a collection and now wants to involve her children, grandchildren, etc. But if you're starting and you think, I would like to do this and I'd like my family to be involved, I think you have to really listen to the other family members about what do they like? What are their interests? A fair is a great opportunity, right? Because you can see all of this because if grandma's thinking old masters and the grandson is thinking, you know, Banksy, we, we will end up with a collection, but not in the sense that we all would mean a collection. We will end up with a mass of stuff. It may be great stuff, but there needs to be some kind of direction. And I think that the conversation, the same way we tell people to have conversations about their estate plans with their children, is the way where you have to start and see if you can find a common thread in a direction that everybody can get behind in the family. And so you have to be part psychologist. Oh yeah, and you, you may need a moderator, you'll probably need a psychologist, I suggest some wine. <laughs> I, I mean, it's not, I think it's very worthwhile. I was saying to one, I have a couple of clients who are, do collect as a family, and then there's some more famous examples of people you know, who are well known. And I think it's really rewarding, but I think it, it, it's going to be, there are going to be moments and it's going to be a challenge and there may be a struggle and you have to be open to finding a, a commonality amongst the, uh, amongst the stakeholders in it. Thank you. Chris, um, so they've acquired the art. It's a family. What conversations do you have? What do you introduce to the family or the entity that's going to be insured? What's the difference between the individual doing that or you know that it involves a family and it's a broader decision from your experience? Well, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for asking that. There, I approach this question, from, I think there's two sides. And I think there's both an opportunity and there's a, a risk. And so we'll start with the positive, right? The opportunity is that working together collaboratively with the family, you can consolidate you know, your, your spending and you can streamline your purchasing. And by having more premium dollars flowing through your insurance program, you're gonna be a more attractive risk and you're gonna be able to negotiate better terms. And it's pretty simple. So the, there, there are, you know, and if there's more family members that you can sort of bring into the pile, then you can really be efficient and you can do some things that aren't available to an individual or maybe an individual doesn't have the scale to do. On the other hand, by having all these other people, you've introduced a lot of complexity. And really, we're talking about communication because as everybody knows, it's, it's one thing to think it and it's another to say it and it's another still to agree upon it. At the end of the day, insurance is really a very simple financial tool. It is a check. They're not gonna make the artwork again. If it's lost, it's gone forever. But the conditions under which you're gonna get that check and how much that check is gonna be is gonna be dependent upon the conversations that you have with your family members. Um, if you're not on the same page with what you want and at the end of the day, if there's a, if there's a loss, that's where you can really have some hurt feelings and some, some, you can lose some, some people can feel like they've lost a considerable amount of money. You know, the other part of it around communication, I think, is around standards, how things are gonna be documented, how they're gonna be cared for, whether or not, you know, your family is going to loan works to museum exhibitions, how, how charitably minded you're gonna be with your collection. If you're not all working together, I, you know, the, you, you've, you've, you've missed an opportunity to do, I think, something, something bigger that an individual is able to do. Okay. Chris, quick follow-up. How do they determine what the correct amount of insurance is? Uh, that's, a, that's a moving target. 
as everybody knows, artwork has this magical alchemy, right? That it is paint on a canvas, and typically property insurance is valued at the replacement cost of that paint and canvas. But because it's introduced into this wonderful market, it could be worth any, what anybody's willing to pay for it at auction. You get two people who want it, and then it goes up from there. So really, the first thing is insurance is there to make somebody whole. That's the fundamental concept in insurance, is that if you've lost something, the insurance company is going to give you the money to replace it. So the, the baseline is purchase price. Whatever you bought it for, you'll get that money back. But as everybody here knows, the art world is a marketplace, and things change. And so really, it's up to the family to have a strategy. It's up to an individual to have a strategy. Some people are very economically minded. They really want to be at the bleeding edge of where the art market is. And they're going to have to take a strategy that involves having you know, third party appraisers come in to take a look at that piece. They may do it once a quarter for some of the really active market-based people. Some others, you can write some pretty broad language into an insurance policy where you get 150% of your scheduled value. So you bought it for $1,000, you schedule it on your insurance policy for $1,000. If the market appreciates after that time, you get, a, you get, a, you know, um, you get 150% of that $1,000 at the time of loss, but you didn't get the big pop that may have been available. And some people are okay with that. Some people really feel like, I bought that thing for $1,000, so I got $1,000 back, I'm fine. The other way to do is you can have a, um, a retail replacement valuation in, the, in your policy, which means that whatever it costs to go hire an art advisor, to go find that thing at the least opportune time and pay the most amount of money for it, so you can replace that object, or one just like the one that you lost. You're going to pay for that privilege, um, but it really comes down to that conversation that you have with your client, with the family members, and say, you know, it's, hey, we don't want to think about this, but if something were to happen, what, what are your expectations? Because I think that not asking that question is setting, setting, some, setting, up, setting up, you know, potential for... Uh, some really hurt feelings in the hurt pocketbook and, you know, and if it's a family, then we're talking about, you know, hurt relationships. And, and Chris, I'm sure that especially with the beginning collector or not beginning the first piece, but just starting to build a collection, part of what you offer is sharing, asking them questions, sharing experiences, because they may not even know to ask these questions. They may not have even explored it. Yeah, you know, that's those, right. Those, yeah. Uh, those questions. Well, and it's like, the, I mean, the, the one thing where people, I think, start to think about it is their first museum loan, or their first loan to maybe a gallery is going to show the piece that they bought a few years ago, and they want to include it in a group show, or they want to include it in a retrospective. And they, you know, some curator comes and they say, hey, you know, Naomi, you bought this piece a couple of years ago. So great. We, we want to put it up. And nobody, they never, how'd you find my name? You know? Yeah. And you decide you're going to do it. But... You don't know what's, what questions to ask. You don't know, you know, the museum's going to send you a loan form. It's probably fine. But you should, you should look and see how that transaction's going to take place. Who's going to be responsible for shipping it? Who's going to be responsible for packing it up when it's done? If, if it's going to get reframed or it's going to be photographed, who's going to be doing that work? If you're going to, you know, go through all of that process and you can learn from somebody who's done it before, you know, I, I invite you to, you know, call, call up your dealer or call up uh, your insurance advisor, or call up somebody who has done it, because there's a lot of pitfalls in that transaction, and that's usually where people start to think about, oh, wait, you know, if something had happened to this, what does happen? So there's a lot of trust, and you also need to have a, a trusted advisor along the way. Yeah. Elisa, I introduced you as somebody who has seen the back end of stories where things did not work out, either because the right communication that take place, as Roberta was mentioning, the insurance was not there. Um, based on what you've seen on the back end, how do you think of, what do you think that the consideration should be a fam for a, as a family, not as an individual, when they start to building a collection or they start adding to an established collection? What are some things that you think, hey, you should be thinking about this, and and how would you advise them? So. We talk a lot with families about family governance principles and setting um, 
a, a, a statement of intention or a mission statement around how they're going to operate their family foundation or they're going to uh, govern the administration of their family company. Same thing goes with an art collection. If they have an established collection, having some family meetings around that collection where perhaps if it's grandma or grandpa started it, they can share with the younger generations the purpose for which the collection was formed, their love for a particular object, their love for a particular artist or genre, so that they can transport some of that knowledge on down through the family. Because it's only with communication where I think that people really have a full understanding of what it means. And then once you have an understanding of what things mean, you can have um, a process around where you can develop some sort of an agreement and develop rules of the road on how that asset, whatever it might be, is going to be governed. Um, so I think starting those conversations with your family members long before there's a life transition event um, is, is very meaningful. And I think it sets the stage, too, if you have an older generation family member who wants to involve the grandkids, for example, um, in their love for, I don't know, impressionist painting, um, perhaps that sets the stage that they have that background as to why that genre is important. But then also you can set a framework for the family conversation so that perhaps the younger generations can start educating the older family members as well. And we see that dynamic play out in different parts of our practice around sustainable investing, for example, or again, family business and family philanthropy. The same principles and, and strategies can apply to working through an art collection. So that information sharing is not just older generation, it, 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 it works both ways. It has to work both it ways. Work Otherwise, both. it's not a dialogue and not everybody in the family is invested in it the same way. Okay. Roberta. Um, Sometimes people say, I'm going to leave my art not to children or to different generations. I'm going to donate it to institutions. And talk about, sometimes it's unilateral. Well, of course, such institution wants my art, but they may not want the art. So people who have that in mind, that altruistic, what should they be doing? Well, the first thing they should do is talk to the institution. Right. Because the whole thing? it will shock you how many people will leave instructions in their estate plan that, you know, around here it's, I, I leave my collection to the Art Institute. Newsflash, they don't want it. There was no conversation. They never sat down with the curatorial staff or the development staff, for that matter, at the institution and said, here's my collection. I would like to leave it to you. So upon their death... It's, it's one of the just the worst feelings. I mean, I know you, you know exactly what I mean when, you know, you're like sitting there going to the family. They're not, they don't. And in fact, when you do that, what you inadvertently do is give the institution the tangible personal property that you said you left them, and they just are going to sell it. They're going to sell it for cash immediately, and... It, it, so then you feel even worse because that's not what the intent of the deceased was. So the first thing to do is say, you got to talk to the museum. And often when clients come back and say, okay, you told me to go call them. I talked to them. They don't want it. I'm like, okay, well, you still want to do this good thing. Where'd you go to college? Where'd your grandchildren go to college? Do they have a museum? Maybe they would love these things, right? They don't get what the Art Institute gets at, you know, small colleges in the middle of the country. So it's, it's again, it's this conversation, and I know it's hard because people don't like to overthink about when they're no longer with us. Can I just add to that? So one thing when you're thinking about leaving a gift to charity is that if they are willing to take some or a portion of your collection, the donor also generally needs to be prepared to give a cash bequest as well to help finance the, the management of the collection and keeping that collection intact. So again, as, as Roberta said, having conversations during lifetime before the will is written and someone has to carry out that instruction to try and get it to the Art Institute of Chicago or some other institution that doesn't want it, um, those conversations are very, very powerful. And it's also many people try to dead hand yeah. their legacy collection and with stipulations like it must be shown. You know, we need to hang it in Juan's office where everybody can see it. You really, 
if you don't have those conversations, that's not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen anyway, because you you know you can't really expect reasonably to control what is on view from year to year unless the prize is such that you really have huge leverage. Or you've created your own museum. Yeah, Chris. Let me, let me just add that a lot of the very significant collections that, that come, you know, available to a museum don't always go as a singular collection. They get broken up among many museums. And there, you know, the, at, when, when, a, when, a, when a collector passes away and the collection gets evaluated, there's a lot of cost involved with storing it, photographing it, documenting the condition. And one strategy that some of the bigger collectors use is, a, is actually they use life insurance policies. And they, they, they will estimate what that cost and expense is going to be and then buy a life insurance policy as part of their estate planning process so that there are, there is, there are funds that are available that don't pass through probate that are available immediately at the time of death so that they can send everything to the conservator, send everything to storage to try and start to figure out the answer to that question. That is very interesting because sometimes when they accept it, they ex accept it with an increase to their endowment to cover the cost. Chris, we talked about somebody, how much insurance should they purchase? You talk about that. They've got the insurance. Within the concept of family, how often should they be reviewing that insurance? Or is it, do you find that sometimes they just insure it and just set it and forget it? I, I would say the number one uh, countervailing force in the insurance business is uh, passivity, right? People set it and forget it. I will say that if your broker is not calling you at least once a year to review that schedule of insurance, review what's in your collection and to prompt you and to ask and to say, did you buy anything this year? Did you have this appraised this year? Did you sell anything? Is this still your house? Is this where it's stored? Then they're not doing their job. And somebody should be prompting that conversation so that it's not something that goes stale. Because as everybody knows, the purpose of art fairs, the auctions, all of this activity is the art market is changing. The values of these things are moving around. And, if, and somebody who's really passionate about the art world, who wants to do the studio visits, go out to dinner with the artists, hang out with the gallerist, they're usually buying something. They're usually buying a couple of pieces, you know. And, they, and the, the challenge is that people don't necessarily think about it. It's kind of a, an afterthought. So it's really the advisor that you're working with who has a responsibility to you as a fiduciary to say, hey, Juan, how was your year? How much art did you buy this year? Oh, right, you know, yes. Oh, and I, I opened a storage space because I bought so much of it. You know? Let me just bounce something between Naomi and Chris for a second. We know that lending a piece to a museum or an institution can add value to it through the provenance that gets created because, wow, this is shown in such and such place. So the part for Naomi is if somebody is borrowing money using their art as collateral, would they be able to do that? And two, Chris, if they do that, what are the insurance considerations when now you have the piece, you loan to the museum, some people might say, well, the museum has insurance. And so I'll start with Naomi, whether that's possible to do when somebody is borrowing against art, and then for Chris as to what are the insurance considerations that you should take at that time. We absolutely foster the idea that artwork should go and travel around and be seen by as many eyes as possible. If it's a museum exhibition, a gallery exhibition, or even coming to an art fair for a potential sale, it only does add to the provenance and the value of the artwork. And we always do uh, encourage our clients to do that if they want. We just simply do a form with a museum that's called a bailment agreement. Then we work with insurers like Chris to make sure we're first loss payee on the claim. There's all these, but it, it really, everything takes about 15 minutes. It's, it's not a difficult thing. And just to add to what you were saying before about the appraisals, if you do borrow against your art collection, we do appraisals every year. We do a mark to market just to make sure that in this volatile market, most of the time going peaking rather than below, 
you can increase the value of your loan if those works of art have gone up in value. So you don't necessarily have to add new pieces if you need more liquidity. You can simply ask us to look at the work the next year. And if it's gone up incrementally, we can probably add some value to your loan. But yeah, and, I, and I, will, I will also stress the importance of working with advisors, with lenders, with a bank, with an insurance advisor, in that whole ecosystem, with people who have experience in the art world. Because as Naomi said, getting the right insurance covenants for, on the policy that gets back to the lender, that understand the transaction, it's going to take 15 minutes. If that person has never done that before, it's going to take two weeks. And it's going to be very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> and they think it's going to take two weeks when they realize it's really not a big deal. You just ask us and we'll take it from there. We are, we are service providers. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ro Ro Roberta and uh, Elisa then, forms of ownership of art when you're talking about a family. You know, uh, Elisa Rizzo owns art all on her own, so she's got the art all her name. But now Elisa's considering the family. What are some options, Roberta and Elisa, as to how to own the art if you're really thinking about it as multi-generational and you've had the right communication that, you know, that, the, that the children, G1, G2, G3, that they want the art? You're the lawyer. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I would say that an LLC or a family limited partnership is a preferred vehicle for holding art if it's intended to be you know, either gifted or contributed to various family members. You can use an LLC, a limited liability company, or family limited partnership to also have some structure around the governance, as I mentioned before. And then in terms of planning, when it's in an entity, it's a lot easier to gift shares of an entity than it is to give shares of a particular painting. So if you have somebody who wants to use their $12 million estate tax exemption this year, um, we can gift up to $12 million to anyone or $24 million between married couples. You can gift that free of estate or gift tax. If you want to use that, that um, exemption to facilitate gifts of art, putting the art in an LLC or a family limited partnership and then gifting away shares of that entity to family members or even to trusts for the benefit of other family members, and a trust is another vehicle that we can you know, weave into the estate planning process. That gives you a lot of leverage in terms of keeping the collection intact. You might be able to take some discounts from a gift tax perspective for valuation purposes, and um, it ensures that the collection can't be sold by any one partner. It also prevents the dreaded fractional ownership. It is Absolutely. very common to meet with heirs and find out that, you know, they, well, grandma had an art collection and, and of course, grandma had said it and forgot it 25 years ago, hadn't been appraised and everything went down except one. And so now you have a very unequal pieces of pie yep. and that when somebody says to me, I'm leaving this, you know, fa fabulous Hudson River School to my six grandchildren, I'm like, Oh my God, please don't do that. So the entity prevents right. that and it makes it less likely that, in, uh, that people are taking things home, as it were, it, that ends up with in inequity, which leads to further need for the psychiatrist to come in and... It, it, it's true, and, 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 and any can be helpful too, even when you've got a collection of multiple pieces. So I worked a couple of years ago on an estate of a client of mine, and he was a big World War II buff, um, and he had an extensive collection of, of um, Winston Churchill memorabilia. Um, he had remarried, I think, two times um, since he had had his children with his first wife, and his estate plan called for the collection, the Winston Churchill collection, to go to his children from the first marriage. He had an entire library full of works and other items. It was not something that could be easily transported to a collective group of children. Um, and so there were some arguments within the family about who was going to take it, which pieces were going to go to which child, how they were going to divide it up. Um, I was very thankful that it was an outright bequest to the children so I didn't have to get in the middle of it too much. Um, but planning and being clear around the planning process is very, very important. And Communication is important. It's been said that you, you tell your children, I'm going to leave my $20 million art collection to you. They stop listening at $20 million. They don't hear the art part of it. Um, I'd like to, and as I'm looking, I see all disciplines, there's probably 
owners, how many people are art collectors that are in the audience? Then we have people that are art professionals. We have esteemed gallery owners that are here with us today. So what questions would you have? And like I said, there could have been a panel discussion on each one of their areas of expertise. So Naomi, thank you. Chris, thank you. Elisa, thank you. Roberta, thank you. Y'all were just incredible. And uh, they're here, they're available. If you wanna grab one of them and, and, and ask them a question, uh, you can, but, and then, but thank you. Thank you for joining us in this panel. Thank you for being a part of Expo. I think it means so much. And we started this off by saying, why do we do these at an art fair? I think we do these at an art fair because we pick up so many people from so many different lines that have an interest in art. And uh, again, thank you for being here. And we really enjoyed spending this time with you. Thank you. <laughs>